Proslogion of Anselm, and I'll be using here the Thomas Williams translation published by Hackett. The Proslogion is a surprisingly short book for a book of its scope and influence. It is really a masterpiece in, well, philosophical theology, I suppose. It's also largely a devotional work. It's a book of spiritual meditation. Uh, it's an attempt on the part of Anselm to help himself and his readers redirect our desires to God. It's also the source of the famous or the infamous ontological argument, and we'll go over that briefly here. But let's begin at the beginning. Incidentally, even before the beginning in this edition, we have a very fine introduction by Thomas Williams. But let's begin here with the prologue. The prologue sets the tone for this book, telling us it's a work of faith-seeking understanding. That's in Latin, fides quireins intellectum, following on the Augustinian theme, if you do not believe, you will not understand. In fact, he quotes Augustine here, and Augustine himself is quoting one of the early Latin translations of a verse in Isaiah in the Old Testament. Unless I believe, I shall not understand. That's in uh, chapter 2. Back to the prologue. Fides quireins intellectum, an even more succinct summary of the Augustinian theme. Faith comes first, and then we work towards understanding what we believe if we can. And in this book, Anselm is going to try to raise his mind to the contemplation of God and seek to understand what he believes. That's the point of the proslogion. And he's going to do it by means of a single idea, in fact, a single argument that needed nothing but itself alone for proof, that would by itself be enough to show that God really exists, that he is the supreme good who depends on nothing else, but on whom all things depend for their being and for their well-being, and whatever we believe about the divine nature. In other words, he wants a single idea of God that will furnish him with a good argument which will lead into doing all these other things, helping him understand what he believes and explain a number of things in theology. Now, the argument, of course, is the ontological argument, and the idea is the idea of the greatest possible being. Not the greatest being, but the greatest possible being. We'll get to that, I suppose, in a moment. Chapter 1 is a rousing of the mind to the contemplation of God. He starts off talking to himself. Come now, you insignificant mortal. Set aside the cares of the world and seek God for a little bit. And he prays to God, asking God to help him find him. And he reviews the biblical narrative, creation, fall, redemption. God created us in his image, for knowledge of him, and boy, did we ever screw it up with our sins. You have created in me this image of you so that I may remember you, think of you, and love you. Yet this image is so eroded by my vices, so clouded by the smoke of my sins, that it cannot do what it was created to do unless you renew and refashion it. We need grace to return to God. And the book is about an ascent of our hearts and of our minds towards a working understanding of and a renewed desire for God. Let me seek you in desiring you. Let me desire you in seeking you. Let me find you in loving you. Let me love you in finding you. Anselm wants to pursue and ultimately find God. That's the point of the book, and that sets the tone. The rest of the book is very uh, pious in similar fashion. He's imitating the Psalms. He's imitating Augustine when Augustine imitates the Psalms. This is a very spiritual work of medieval philosophy, yes, but also uh, medieval devotional literature. Chapter 2 and chapter 3 give us the infamous ontological argument. The ontological argument itself occupies, in this particular text, only one page plus about half of another page, which is surprisingly short considering how much effort has been put into uh, managing the ontological argument, in many cases refuting it, sometimes correcting it, uh, since, since Anselm. Anselm says, We believe that you are something than which nothing greater can be thought. Speaking to God, much of this book is written again, as a prayer in imitation of the Psalms. We believe that you are something than which nothing greater can be thought. And he elaborates, It is one thing for an object to exist in the understanding and quite another to understand that the object exists in reality. And it is greater to exist in reality and not just in the understanding. That is to say, something that exists only in the mind is not as great as something that exists outside of the mind. Now here's, here's an illustration I like to use. Picture the greatest possible 
McDonald's milkshake. If you like, switch to something else. Uh, your, the dessert of your choice, the candy of your choice, the drink of your choice, the, the sandwich of your choice. Picture the greatest possible sandwich, or I'm going to go with McDonald's milkshakes. I like the chocolate McDonald's milkshakes, and now I'm picturing the greatest possible chocolate McDonald's milkshake. And of course, since it's the greatest possible, it's got extra chocolate, and it's extra large, and since it's the greatest possible, it's filled with vitamins, but it doesn't taste like it's filled with vitamins. It tastes like the best chocolate milkshake any McDonald's ever made. In fact, ten times as good as that. It is the greatest possible chocolate milkshake, and in fact, it's healthy for me, not only because of the vitamins, but, you know, whatever proteins and lipids and whatnot are in this thing, it's the perfect thing for me to take in massive quantities. It's a huge milkshake with lots of chocolate and vitamins, and there's only one thing wrong with this milkshake. It only exists in my head, so it would be much better if it were actually real. And Anselm says God is, by definition, the greatest possible being. So imagine... God does not exist. Non-existence is an imperfection in this milkshake. So, suppose God does not exist. That means the greatest possible being is not as good as some possible being, namely a God who does exist. It's possible that God exists, right? So, if God does not exist, then the greatest possible being is not the greatest possible being, because the God who really would exist is greater still. Or, we can put it this way, suppose God does not exist. In that case, the greatest being, the most perfect being, has an imperfection. Either way, we have a contradiction, or however we rephrase it. The greatest possible being is not the greatest possible being, or a perfect being has an imperfection, if God does not exist. And what does that tell us? It tells us God exists. Roughly, that's how the ontological argument goes. And this means that, well, this means that God exists, and God is the greatest possible being. The being, note well, than which nothing greater can be conceived. Not only the greatest being who exists, not only the greatest being who ever did or ever will exist, yes, those things, but more. God is the greatest possible being. It is not even possible for anything to be greater than God. And Anselm thinks this demonstrates the existence of God, since non-existence would be an imperfection in such a being. Now, what does that tell us? about God, such that Anselm can add oh, from page uh, from page 8 to page uh, 25. All those extra pages, we sometimes look at this book for the ontological argument, but that's only one and a half pages out of pages 8 to 25 of the book, not counting the three, four, five pages of the prologue in chapter 1. What happens in chapters 4 through 26? Let's go over some of the highlights. In chapters 4 through 26, Anselm will build on the idea of God as the greatest possible being in order to explain some puzzles in philosophical theology, in order to demonstrate some other points of the faith, in order to explain how God is, for example, in chapter 8, both merciful and impassable. Impassable means unaffected. The greatest possible being is not subject to being changed by anything else. Its power is such that nothing else can affect it and change it. So how is God merciful, but also not able to be affected? We are in our normal way of thinking of mercy. It's a largely passive thing. It's a response to suffering, for example. And if God is merciful, how can he also be impassable or unaffected? And how does God spare the wicked if you are completely and supremely just? How do you spare the wicked if you are completely and supremely just? Ansel masks in chapter 9. The idea of the greatest possible being helps to answer questions like these. Let's go over just one example. How is it that God is omnipotent, but unable to do just anything. This is chapter 7. We could call this the problem of omnipotence. But how are you omnipotent if you cannot do everything? And how can you do everything if you cannot be corrupted or lie or cause what is true to be false or many other such things? God is unable to sin. God is unable, we might also add, to die. God can't die, sin, lie, or be corrupted or cause what is true to be false or many other such things. So how is God omnipotent? And Anselm says... Well, if we look at the idea of the greatest possible being, we understand that, in fact, omnipotence is power. And power does not mean the ability to do just anything, since many things, like dying, are not abilities of power, but abilities of weakness. It's not 
power that gives you the ability to die, but weakness that gives you the ability to die. And similarly, the ability to lie or be corrupted or cause what is true to be false is not a power, but a weakness. And God's inability to do certain things is an expression, or rather a consequence, of God's power, not some contradiction with God's power. And thus, says Anselm, I believe you could find Aquinas giving a similar analysis later in the Summa Theologica. All right, God is percipient, omnipotent, merciful, impassable, just as God is living, wise, good, happy, eternal, and whatever it else, whatever else it is better to be than not to be. God is everything it is better to be than not to be, because God is the greatest possible being. If there is any quality that it is better to have than not to have, that quality is a quality God has. Now, let's say something about divine simplicity. Divine simplicity is the idea that God is a single unified whole. God does not have any parts. Anselm thinks it's better to be a single unified whole, or simple, than it is to have parts. And so he thinks God is simple. But there's more to divine simplicity than just this, uh, this abstract metaphysical principle. It, it's better to be a whole than to have parts, a unified whole that doesn't have parts, than to have parts, and so God being the greatest possible being must be a single unified whole. Yes, that's an Anselmian way of thinking, but there's more to it than that. The doctrine of divine simplicity allows Anselm to think that whatever quality God has, God also is. So you can say that God is wise, but you also get to say God is wisdom. You can say God is good. You can say God has goodness, but you can also say God is goodness. God is not just a being who's good enough to have some goodness or have some justice or have some wisdom, but to actually be goodness, to be justice, to be wisdom. You could connect Anselm, in fact, to the Platonic tradition of talking about forms. There is such a thing as the form of the good, the non-physical reality, which is goodness itself, which is the source of the goodness everything good has. Here's a good book. There are some good books. Here's a good teacup. And all their goodness derives from goodness itself. And goodness itself in the Platonic tradition is a real thing and a non-physical thing. And Anselm agrees and says that non-physical real thing is actually God. God is now, let me, let me rephrase this. He's speaking to God. He says, but clearly you are whatever you are, not through anything else, but through yourself. God doesn't derive his wisdom from some wisdom which is distinct from God. He doesn't derive his goodness from some form of goodness from which he gets his goodness. God is identical to his own qualities. You are whatever you are, not through anything else, but through yourself. Therefore, you are the very life by which you live, the wisdom by which you are wise, and the very goodness by which you are good to the good and to the wicked, and so on for similar attributes. God is identical to whatever his attributes are. He has them to an infinite extent, and he actually is them. That was chapter 15. Skipping a bit, chapter 18 goes over divine simplicity. Again, you are in fact unity itself, says Anselm. And let's, uh, let's not go over the analysis here in any detail. Again, it's a short book. You can read it for yourself. By the end of chapter 18, though, Anselm has used the doctrine of simplicity to argue for the doctrine of timelessness, which is to say God is outside of time. If God were inside time, then a part of God would exist at one time and another part of God would exist at another time, which is to say God would have parts. So simplicity proves timelessness. If God has no parts, then God must be outside of time, or thus Anselm reasons. It follows that no part of you or of your eternity exists at a certain place or time. Instead, you exist as a whole in every place, and your eternity exists as a whole always. Uh, chapter 19, you are simply outside time altogether. This idea of timelessness is not original to Anselm. Uh, Aquinas takes it up later, and Anselm no doubt got it from Augustine. Anselm continues. We have to skip so much interesting material. Chapter 23 gives us the doctrine of the Trinity. God is Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and they're all equally God. Chapter 24. Chapter 25. Chapter 24. If there are many and great delights and delightful things, what kind and how great a delight is there in him who made those delightful things? If God made tea and if tea is delightful, how much more delightful is the God who made it delightful? And repeat that for everything else good that exists. God created it. 
except for himself. God did not create himself. God exists in and of himself. God is the source of his own existence. But uh, God was not created. But God created everything else. And repeat the exercise for every good thing. Whatever goodness there is in any good thing, recognize that that goodness comes from God. And chapter 25 advises us to seek the goodness of God, for therein lies ultimate happiness. Happiness comes from enjoying goodness, as Anselm had learned from reading much Augustine, no doubt, and from reading Boethius. And we are to love the goodness of God, for there we shall be happy. The goodness of God is the source of all happiness, and we shall be much happier if we adore God and uh, redirect our desires towards God. Ascent in knowledge uh, but we, um, Anselm is attempting to ascend in knowledge to God, ascend in knowledge by means of contemplating the idea of God as the greatest possible being. is very much the point of this book, but it is also a book about ascent in desire. We're supposed to know God better, and we're supposed to enjoy God better as a result of these reflections.